The first reading is from Daniel chapter 3. Um, you probably can't follow it too well in the church Bibles because it's sort of extract. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then a herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. There are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then, what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisers crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Uh, and then we've got a reading from Matthew, uh, chapter 10. Verses 18 to 20 and verse 22. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Have you ever had a bonfire or a campfire? You know how you smell of the smoke? It's very hard to get rid of it, isn't it, from your hair and your clothes. It just clings. Maybe a nice smell, maybe not. But isn't it incredible? I love that detail in the reading that we heard from Daniel, that when those men came out of the furnace, you couldn't even smell the smoke on them. Last week we heard how God opened the eyes of Elisha's young servant so that he could see angelic hosts encircling them and protecting them from the threatened attack of the Arameans. Today we learn that God's people may go through fiery trials, but God will be there with them. We also see that speaking truth to power can be dangerous, but can have surprising results. The book of Daniel is a book of two parts. The early chapters tell several famous and gripping stories. Daniel in the den of lions, and the hand that wrote on the wall during Belshazzar's sacrilegious feast, as well as today's story of the burning, fiery furnace. The second half of the book is about the heavenly visions and prophetic messages that Daniel received. The setting is Babylon in the 6th century BC, during the time when the Jews were in exile there. And the book begins with King Nebuchadnezzar recruiting some of the cream of the Jewish exiles to be groomed for leadership roles. They were to be young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from his table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. And among these were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They made a stand against eating the royal food and wine, insisting on a diet of vegetables and water instead, on which they thrived. At the end of their three years of training, the king talked with them, and he found none equal to them in wisdom and understanding, and so they entered the king's service. It's not surprising, is it, that the Babylonian officials were jealous of their promotion. And so they seized on the ways in which their Jewish faith set them apart in their behaviour to make accusations against them and try to bring them down. It happened to Daniel in the story when he was thrown to the lions. And in today's story, the accusers say, There are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs, whom you, king, have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. You promoted them, and they're disregarding you. They neither neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you've set up. Nebuchadnezzar is furious. If you don't worship my golden image, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Note that the king is throwing down the gauntlet to God as well as to the three men. And their reply is remarkable. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So I've got a question for you. Does God deliver them from the blazing furnace? No, it is the king who tells them to come out. But the reason is because he has seen a fourth figure walking in the flames with the three men, one who looks like a son of the gods. And many believe that this, like the story of Abraham's visitors, is what's called a theophany, an example of Jesus appearing on earth 
for specific reasons in Old Testament times. God didn't put the fire out. He didn't lift them out of the fire. He came and joined them there. As I've already mentioned, uh, the details about how they came out are amazing. Their bodies weren't harmed, their hair wasn't singed, their clothes weren't scorched, and they didn't even smell of smoke. And what was the result? The king acknowledged the power of the God on whose protection they had staked their lives. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Now, a word of warning, if you read on in the story, you'll find that he did go rather over the top in his threats to anybody else who didn't in future acknowledge the God of the Jews. But nevertheless, he did recognise the power of God at work there. What can we learn from this story? Think again of that fourth figure the king saw in the furnace. And listen to these words from Isaiah chapter 43. The Lord says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Now, I'm sure there are many here who have testimonies themselves, or we know others in our church family who have testified to how God has been there with them in the darkest and most desperate situations, when they felt as if they were drowning in grief or going through fiery trials. Our dear friends Sue and Kevin Powell, who suffered such a dreadful, multiple bereavement, have testified to how they felt carried when they didn't know how to bear the pain. I'd love to invite you, as Tristan did last week, to come and share some testimonies, but because there's another part to what I want us to think about this morning, I just suggest you share them with one another after the service. This story tells us that God doesn't rescue us from pain and suffering. But when they come, he is there with us, and our life is safe with him whatever happens. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer, physically and mentally, and to be tempted to give up, and to choose the easy way out. Remember the temptations in the wilderness. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, let this cup pass. In the book of Hebrews, it says he shared in our humanity so that he could rescue us, not from going through trouble, but from the fear of death. Remember Psalm 23. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I had a lovely morning uh, last week with a lady called June, who briefly worshipped in our Thursday congregation until cancer overtook her um, in many parts of her body. And she is such a living witness to faith and trust and calm and confidence. When the cancer first came on, she and her son were praying that God would heal her But I've noticed that her her prayers and her thinking have moved on now. I think she recognises that this is going to be um, a terminal cancer. But the thing that she is now praying above all is that those members of her family who don't yet know the Lord and who are reluctant to discuss with her her approaching death because they can't bear the thought of it, her prayer is that they will come to know the Lord, so that for them too, as for her, the fear of death is removed by the knowledge of 
our Saviour's death and how he's brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. So if you're going through fiery trials at the moment, please be encouraged by this story. And if you'd like prayer ministry at the end of the service, then do please do that or pray for one another. But what we can scarcely imagine is what it's like to be a believer in a country where Christians are singled out and threatened with death, just like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were. Do you know that 5,898 Christians were murdered for, your, for their faith last year? 5,898. And we're going to watch a video now by Open Doors, the organisation which supports persecuted Christians. There are countries where Christians live in fear, where churches are bombed and houses burned, where following Jesus means sacrificing jobs, security, family. There are countries where you must keep your faith secret or it might get you killed. These are the countries of the Open Doors World Watch List and here are the 10 countries where following Jesus costs the most. Number 10, India. Many extremists claim that to be Indian is to be Hindu. They want an India without religious minorities and they are using violence to achieve it. Number nine, Iran. Iranian Christians must meet secretly. Being discovered could mean long sentences in appalling prisons. Number eight, Pakistan. Christians in Pakistan are considered second-class citizens. Innocent believers are falsely accused of blasphemy. Thousands of women are victims of kidnap and forced conversion. Number seven, Nigeria. Nigeria is the country where Christians face the most outright violence. Many Christians have been killed or driven from their homes. Number six, Eritrea. More than 1,000 Christians are imprisoned for their faith in Eritrea. Some pastors have been locked up for over a decade without charge. Number five, Yemen. Yemeni culture is tribal. Those who leave the tribal faith could be banished or even killed. Number four, Libya. In this lawless land, Libyan Christians have to keep their faith secret or risk punishment, arrest or death. Number three, Somalia. Islamist extremists consider Somali Christians high value targets. So the tiny population of only a few hundred secret believers keep out of sight. Number two, North Korea. There are around 400,000 Christians in North Korea. All of them must hide their faith. Discovery means exile, execution, or being worked to death in horrific labor camps. Number one, Afghanistan. The Taliban takeover means that Afghanistan is the new number one, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Many Christians have become refugees. Those who remain must keep their faith utterly secret. There are countries where Christians live in fear, but fear can lead to courage and courage leads to hope. At least 360 million Christians around the world experience high levels of persecution and discrimination, but they have not given up. And for over 65 years, Open Doors has stood with them. Where Christians are persecuted, our global underground networks supply smuggled Bibles and Christian books, spiritual care, emergency food and aid, training and legal advice. Where Christians are free, we work with local churches to raise our voices in prayer to speak truth to those in power, to strengthen our persecuted family around the world. Because there are countries where Christians have to stay silent and there are countries where Christians can make a noise. But we are all connected. We are all family and together we can help one another to follow Jesus no matter the cost.
If you'd like to receive information from Open Doors and pray for persecuted Christians, I can give you the details of their website afterwards. It's very sobering, isn't it? Makes us feel how blessed we are and how feeble and pathetic we so often are, I speak for myself, in our witness. But there's no knowing when we might find ourselves up against it for what we believe. Many Christians in caring professions in our country have faced reprisals for wearing a cross or offering to pray with someone. Some have been taken to court for making a stand on what they believe is and isn't right. There's much legislation proposed which will make it harder for us to share what we believe. Christian school governors may find themselves having to make a stand about policy and practice which will put them at risk. At the very least, any of us may find ourselves challenged in a hostile way or mocked for our faith. In our second reading, Jesus told his disciples they might well find themselves arrested, but he made an extraordinary promise which we too can claim when we find ourselves with our backs up against the wall. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. And of course, the preliminary to that is being open and listening and ready to to sense those nudges from the Holy Spirit that this is a moment when I can speak. And if we, ha if we get that nudge, then we can have this confidence that it won't be you speaking, as Jesus said, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And that brings us back to the breathtakingly brave words of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Lord, we pray that you'll give us courage to continue to stand as your followers, as your disciples, however hostile the environment we may find ourselves in. And we, we trust that you will give us the courage and the words. And I have one other prayer as we come to the end of this series, this series of heavenly encounters. So we pray together, Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves that we may keep in mind the things we've learnt in this series on heavenly encounters. May we be more aware of your presence in our everyday living and working and speaking. And may we learn to see what's happening around us and to us through the lens of spiritual awareness. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>